All right, it's a beautiful afternoon in Syracuse, New York, and I'm excited to introduce this project P2, which is a compiler from a significant subset of Scheme down to the Lambda calculus. This is such a cool project to me because it's so not obvious that you could just take an arbitrary racket expression and turn it into just the Lambda calculus and then just use beta reduction to actually implement any computation you wanted. You know, it's ridiculously inefficient and you would never really want to implement a, a you know, programming language like that. But it's so cool to me that just with beta reduction, you can do pretty much any computation you want. And I really feel like this project hits that home. So I'm pretty excited about it. Now, in the last lecture, we used uh, church numerals and operations over arithmetic. And after the last lecture, I really expect you to be able to do operations like the one I have right here. So being able to encode arithmetic operations like 2 plus 3 times 4 plus 1, you should be able to encode those in just the lambda calculus using only lambdas, since that's going to be how we start this project. And in this project, what we're going to do is translate arbitrary scheme programs that I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, into the lambda calculus. So we're going to have uh, let rec, we're going to have let with variable arguments, we're going to have uh, lambdas with uh, any number of arguments, and then any number of applications. We're going to have symbols, uh, we're going to have if branching, uh, and then we're going to have primitive application, and we're also going to have one other feature that we're actually going to talk about uh, next week, which is uh, let rec. And let rec lets you build recursive loops. So we're going to be able to do things like define the Fibonacci function or write little Sudoku solvers in our language, which I think is particularly cool. It's going to make you able to, uh, able to write really huge programs in this language and still execute them just using the Lambda calculus. So the output language is just the Lambda calculus. So it's Lambda X of E, or it's some E applied to another E, or it's some X, which is a symbol. And remember, if you were to write this as a little racket type predicate, you would have lambda and then you would be matching symbol ha huh? and then you would be matching two expressions applied to each other and these would all be little quoted s expressions using quasi quoting but i think for now we can write them as sort of uh, mature computer scientists eh? um, so let's go through the forms uh, one by one and just talk to you about how to translate them so the first one is uh, currying so currying is a trick where you can take a lambda that has some number of arguments, some fixed number of arguments, like a three argument lambda, and translate that into a sequence of three lambdas. So if I have three arguments, I can translate that into lambda x, which hands me back lambda y, which hands me back lambda z, which then the body has x, y, and z all in scope. The only trick is if I do that, I have to remember to fix up application call sites appropriately. So the place where I call f now has to be translated to be F applied to A, all of that applied to B, applied to C, applied to D. All right, so currying fixes up uh, lambdas and call sites harmoniously to make this multi uh, sort of apl multi argument application kind of work out. And I'm also going to say it's going to make your semantics particularly easy to implement other stuff if we have a translation for the zero argument lambda case. All right, so this is just what we typically call a thunk. Now the lambda calculus doesn't write, let us write uh, zero argument lambdas. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna include this fake underscore argument just to satisfy the terms of the lambda calculus, even though we just won't use it. It's always okay to you know, include a variable we don't need, right? But this will allow us to keep the structure of this lambda right here in terms of when things get computed. All right, so we started with this language right here, pretty large language. But we're all the way down to uh, this already. So let has been encoded. Don't have to deal with let. Uh, now we just have single arguments for our lambdas. We also have single arguments for our applications where we had multiple arguments before. We're taking care of all of that with our transformation for let and for currying. All right. And so now we need to talk about how do we encode if and also how do we encode booleans. I haven't talked to you about how to encode true and false yet. So we need an encoding that does this behavior. So if I do if of true, whatever my encoding for true is, and I do et and ef, well, that had better reduce to whatever the encoding of et would end up being, all right? And if I do if of false, and I encode all of that, and then I do the computation of the lambda calculus, well, that had better implement, or that had better end up being whatever ef reduces to. So that's what my encoding needs to do. Let's try one encoding right now, and let's try something where I encode true as a two argument lambda that returns its first argument. So what I'm doing here is I'm sort of taking a callback for true and a callback for false, not really a callback, but just a value for true and a value for false, and I'm returning the value for true. And then I can translate 
the implementation of the if form to just be an application of ET and EF. And remember, I need to do the trick where I curry them appropriately, but I'm going to define them in terms of multi-argument lambdas, and then I'm assuming you can use the currying transformation down the line to get it sort of right in terms of the lambda calculus, all right? But unfortunately, this translation is critically broken. So this translation for true and false, if we even change this to, uh, to F here for false, it's almost correct, but it's not quite correct. And here's why. So if we have if true zero omega, in most programming languages, we don't want to execute the false branch unless we actually have the guard turn out be false. All right? But using this translation we've got right here, we actually end up with that behavior. And it's because, at least if we translate this down to the lambda calculus, which we then execute in racket, if we execute this using a call by value language, it's going to force us to compute both of these arguments as values to weak head normal form before we can actually apply this function. All right, so even though we wanted this to result in zero, it would actually result in non-termination because we would always work on trying to evaluate this omega combinator right here, which is the argument to this, uh, to this lambda, and we would never be able to do it. So the trick is that we're gonna eta expand. We're going to stick a lambda in front of the true branch and the false branch, which is then going to put them in weak head normal form so that then call by value languages will not evaluate them until we actually evaluate them in either true or false. So that's why this is going to work. Our encoding for true is going to be this lambda that takes two arguments and calls its first argument. Our encoding for false is going to be a lambda that takes two arguments and returns its second argument or calls its second argument, not returns. And remember, I'm specifying those in terms of the previous transformation we had where we could have multi-argument uh, lambdas. All right, so if you do that, you can even write your implementation to recursively call churchify, and you'll get a really nice uh, implementation like this. All right, so that's how you encode booleans, and that's also how you encode uh, true, or sorry, uh, ifs. So for ifs, what you do is you take the guard and you apply it to a... Uh, true branch and false branch, but you wrap those both in a zero argument lambda. All right, so now we're just down to this language where we've removed if, and all we have is basically primitive operations over built-in data types, which are going to be um, natural numbers and lists. So the empty list is the only constructor. Now the key is that we already taught you how to do all of the arithmetic stuff. So in the last video, we already talked to you about how to do church encoding for the natural numbers and how to do church encoding for things like plus and times. And there are some other ones that we're going to include as bonus as well, but you can look them up on the internet if you'd like. We have some instructions about in the readme about how to do sub one and minus and equal and things like that. So the only thing we really need to teach you now how to do is uh, let rec and then also uh, cons, car, cutter, and nulha. And then we need to teach you how to encode the empty list. And then with the empty list and cons, you can build everything else. So, how are we going to encode lists? Lists are either the empty list or con cells. And so what we can do is we can encode them as a sort of two argument function or a chain of functions that has a callback for what to do when it's a con cell and a callback for what to do when it's null. And then the implementation of null will just call the callback for null with zero arguments because of course null doesn't have any information it can convey. Now for cons, we can have callbacks for cons and null, and the implementation of cons is going to call win cons on A and B, because A and B are both pieces of information held in the con cell that then get passed to the callback to handle, all right? And it turns out using these definitions, if you then church encode A and B here, you can translate any expression with conses to the lambda calculus. So how would we define car, cutter, and nulha? So I'll tell you how to define nulha here, and then I'm going to let you work out car and cutter on your own. So here's nulha. We take a list, and then we pass for the cons callback. That's going to take um, two arguments, A and B, which is going to be the two values in the cons cell. And we're going to return false, because nulha should return false when this list is a uh, cons cell. And for the true callback, or sorry, for the null callback, we're going to pass a lambda that takes zero arguments because null doesn't give us any information and returns true. Because when this list right here is null, nullha should return true. All right, 
So now all we have left is let rec. And let rec is a really fun one. You have to use the Y combinator basically to do it. And uh, it's a pretty cool technique, but it's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. It's gonna take a little bit more nuance to explain and I'm gonna need to show some more examples. So get started on all of the other forms now based on the transformations I've talked about. And also be sure to read the readme.md. It gives some really helpful hints about how to start tackling the project and really gives you a roadmap for how you should implement things. If I were you, I would go start working on the churchify function now. The first thing I would implement is handling the numbers case because we've told you how to you know, translate church numerals. So take number has and translate them down into church encoded version of the natural numbers. And then also handle multiply and addition. Those are two other ones that you can handle really easy. Make sure that you uh, do the sort of curried transformation to apply them in the correct way and then test them out and make sure you get the right thing by doing church to net. All right, so that's sort of a primer on the uh, project P2. And it is, uh, I think, a little bit more challenging project than the first previous two. Uh, so please be sure to ask questions in class and collect them. I'm really happy to answer questions over Slack as well. So please feel free to reach out for help as well there too.